Morning, church. Um, today's teaching text is Titus 2, uh, verses 11 to 14, and I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. It reads as follows. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lusts, and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse himself and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do um, good works. This is the word of the Lord. My name is Naseho and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City as an elder and this morning a special privilege of sharing the word of God as we end of our series called That's Great News, which speaks about the stages of Jesus' life and how they speak hope in all seasons of our lives. We believe the great news is found in being gospel-centered, the great news is found in the Bible, the living word of God. These great news bring hope. They restore they comfort, they bring peace and bring life. Let me bring you into one of the conversations we have as elders, um, with your permission, mate. So we believe that elders are responsible for church growth, health, and discipline. This means we are mindful of what we teach as we want to see lives changed and transformed through the gospel for Jesus. We want to see lives changed and transformed through the gospel for Jesus. So one of, one of our calls would start like this. We need to, to plan a new series. And we have been journeying through a book. So remember, uh, Acts. Acts is the book that we just did before this new series. That's great news. And then we talk about what should we teach now. What do our people need to hear? What do our people need in their diet? We see ourselves as two shifts. Um, a sous chef is an assistant to the head chef, and the head chef is God. So we are the sous chefs. We ask God and we discern what our people need, what season our people are in, all the parts of the meal that we're creating as sous chefs, guided and directed by God. We speak about what we've done recently to know what is already in that stew, in that pot, so we don't overdo one thing or the other, so we don't have too many New Testament or too many Old Testament or too many topical or too many books. We make sure that we have a balanced diet. So we put what, what we've already done before, and then we start to talk again about what do our people need to hear? What does God want to say to our people? He is the, he's the head chef after all. Sometimes we need a bit of a break as we continue to pray and discern more. We let it simmer and we come back again to ask God to lead us. We felt that we're in a season where people are dealing with a lot. It is September, the years running past. Pressures from different avenues, from work, from home, from personal ambitions. We felt that our people may be stuck in some ways pressured, in some ways detached, worried, anxious, hurt, confused, needing of encouragement. We felt that our people are flat, our people are up, and we need hope. Collectively, we need hope. We need encouragement. We need gospel renewal individually and corporately. We need reminding that Christ is enough to sustain us through the hills and valleys of life. We need reminding that Christ is enough to sustain us through the hills and valleys of, of life. Reminding us that God is alive and renews and revives us. Then we talk about whether this needs to be a book or whether this needs to be a topical study. And we felt that it needed to be a topical study now, a short one. So that doesn't require too much of our people. But also a topical study that's evangelistic but pastoral, speaking through the milestones of Jesus' life and how those renew us as we read them, as we engage with them. And those milestones are the perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and return 
of Jesus Christ. This should bring us hope. This should revive our souls in any season. This morning, we've already dished up the, the last five weeks. This morning, we're at the tail end of what God has made here through this series. We're going to be licking that last bit of sauce from the bowl, licking this last few bones as we enjoy the word of God this morning. This morning, we look at the return of Jesus Christ. We do so through the lens of Titus 2, verses 11 to 14. Just three verses, but a lot packed in there. And we engage the text this morning through four points. The first and second coming. The first point. The second point, the importance of the return. The importance of the second coming of Jesus. Then who is the return? Who is the second coming of Jesus for? And then the implications for the return, the implications of the second coming of Jesus. Let's pray and ask God through his Holy Spirit to speak to us. Lord, we thank you that this morning we can gather as your people. We can sit under your word. We can hear you speak to us, those things that you'd want us to know, to say, and to do. This morning I pray against all distractions, I pray that you'd help us to focus on you. I pray that wherever we are, that you would meet us. That through your Holy Spirit, that you'd help us to hear you, hear your voice. Hear you convict or encourage us. And that we would be pliable. That we would heed to the Holy Spirit speaking to us. That we would heed to the word of God. Be changed, be transformed, be renewed. Be encouraged, be edified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, if you feel flat, if you feel pressure, feel the weight of life, sin, loss, brokenness, or in despair, if you feel like no one sees you or sees where you are, this is what Jesus would have you know. His grace is sufficient for you. His grace is is sufficient for you. He loves you, and proof of that love is found on the cross where he wiped away all your and my sins and made us his children. But how can we be confident of this? How can we be confident that God, who is holy, merciful, and just, would save us, would forgive us? See, we desire to take the place of God many times. We desire to be in control, we desire to lead our lives, maybe in ways that we shouldn't. We raise our fist at God because we believe we know better. Even though he is holy, merciful, and just, he chooses to save us. He chooses to forgive us through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. Our belief, our confidence in God saving us and forgiving us is found in Romans 6 verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. Christ, crucified for our sins and raised from the dead, is the grace of God for those who believe. That is what Romans 6 says. We see the grace of God and the same confidence in Titus. This morning we look at the book of Titus to learn more about the return of Jesus Christ and what it means for us, how this is great news. So this is an image from the Bible Project, which you'll see behind me. This gives an overview of the book of Titus. So Titus was a trusted companion of Paul, a faithful servant of Jesus Christ. Titus was a Greek and led to faith by Paul. He was drawn to the ministry of Paul and went with Paul and Barnabas to Antioch, to Jerusalem, from Antioch to Jerusalem. He also served in the church at Corinth. Titus and Paul then traveled to Crete, which is a large island which has strategic harbors that serve as cities around them. That's where the context of this book is, in the city of Crete. In chapter 1, Paul introduces us to the hope of eternal life. That is the sense we get or the emphasis we get through chapter 1, through the first part of chapter 1. Hope of eternal life, promised by a God who does not lie, a God who is faithful and true. Titus in chapter one, in, in Paul in chapter one then continues with instruction to Titus so that he would strengthen the ministry 
to appoint elders in the different towns. Titus was to maintain sound doctrine because there were bad influences, corrupt leaders, people who claimed to know God, but only by word and not by their actions. Chapter 2, where we are, we're seeing a strong sense of the grace, the generous grace of God, which is the reason for good living. The, the generous grace of God, which is the reason for good living. That's chapter 2. So let's dive in. The first and second coming. So Titus 2, verse 11 to 14, is one long sentence. There are no full stops, but it's a dense sentence, and it includes two repeated themes. So appeared and appearing, which we see. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. That's verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And verse 13, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What does the grace of God has appeared mean? That's a great question. Let's look at Titus 3 as well. Titus 3 verses 4 to 6 helps us a little. It reads as follows, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This grace of God that appeared is Jesus in his mercy, in his goodness, and loving kindness. He appears to save us, to save us. Verse 14 explains how the grace appeared. Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So scripture interpreting scripture. The grace of God is Jesus Christ, who in his mercy, goodness, loving kindness, appears to save us, to redeem us, to purify for himself a people of his own. This is alluding to the first coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus, born as a baby in Bethlehem, part of fulfillment of scripture, coming down from heaven. We could do nothing to fix our relationship, our broken relationship with God the Father. He is just, he's a just God and there's payment of sins, which is death, that needs to happen. So then Jesus comes down from heaven, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born to the Virgin Mary. This is the perfect birth. This is Jesus coming in the most humble manner, born in Bethlehem in a manger, which is followed by more fulfillment of scripture in the perfect life, the perfect death and resurrection. We have spent five weeks so far looking at the perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension. And I want to echo the words of Sitle, who preached two weeks ago, that if there is no resurrection, if there is no ascension, if there is no perfect life, birth, and death, then we may as well eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we die because there is no purpose. We fool ourselves, we are misled, and we are the shame of the world. But if the perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension and return are true, which we can see in the Bible, then, then we ought to really consider the gospel for it is true, because it truly is life-giving. Jesus lived a perfect life because he had no sin. He faced all the challenges of life, but he remained without sin. This makes him the perfect mediator and advocate for us. The perfect death and resurrection is part of the fulfillment of scripture, that the temple would be destroyed and then rebuilt in three days that access to God the Father would be enabled through the resurrection of Jesus. He is risen. He has conquered death. This is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. It is Jesus Christ appearing in mercy, goodness, and loving kindness to save a people who can't save themselves, a people that rightfully need to face the wrath of God, but a people who instead experience the grace of God if they have believed. The grace of God also helps us, we see in verse 12, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lusts and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope. 
there are two reasons why there ought to be a change in how we live. The first reason is because of the work of Christ on the cross. The grace of God should compel us to live lives that reflect that we know him, that we know the truth, that we know the grace of God which brings salvation as we see in Titus. Because of this, we ought to live lives that are godly, not controlled by worldly passions, not being in love with the world, but in love with Christ. The second reason is because of the blessed hope. Other versions say our blessed hope. It is ours because of the return of Jesus Christ. We are waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's his return. Our blessed hope if you see it in the context of the scripture, sitting in between the first and the second coming of Jesus. So one more illustration of food, I promise. So our blessed hope is like the inside of a burger, surrounded by the appearing of Jesus Christ, his first and his second coming. Our blessed hope lies there right in the middle, but not just any burger. I always thought an upside down burger was a burger without the bun, but that shows the limits of my burger game. It, <laughs> This burger is more like a bunless burger, where you have patties as the bun and more goodness inside. <laughs> like a KFC double down, which has real chicken as a bun. This is because our blessed hope is surrounded by so much power. I didn't want people after the service to rebuke me for using a seedless or a seeded bun to compare verses 11 and 13, because these verses are so good. That's the top and the bottom of our burger. So verse 11 says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Hmm. Here is the aim of verse 11. Look at verse 12. The aim of verse 11, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lust and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope. So the aim of his first coming bringing salvation for all people so that we would live godless, we would we'd deny godlessness and worldly lust and live in a sensible manner and then wait for his return, wait for the blessed hope. Then here's the bottom of our burger. The appearing of the glory of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here's the effect of the grace of God. He gave himself for us, verse 14. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own, eager to do good works. This is why it can't be a seed or a seedless bun. It's surrounded by some, by our, our blessed hope is surrounded by something so good, the first coming and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Our blessed hope is because of what Jesus Christ has already done, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. Our blessed hope is his ultimate return. His first coming shows the aim that we would live lives that reflect us knowing the truth by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in hard times, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we remember the blessed hope. In hard times, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we remember the blessed hope, which is Jesus Christ's death, resurrection, ascension, and return. And the effect of that the effect of that grace is him redeeming and cleansing us as his possession and his people to do good. Mm, it's, a, it's a delicious burger that we just uh, consumed now. The importance, so we get into our second point, the importance of the return. So we see the first appearing of Jesus Christ linked with the grace and the second appearing of Jesus Christ linked with the glory. The first linked with grace and the second with glory. In Paul's mind, these can't be separated. These can't be separated. The second coming or the return of Jesus is as true or even more true and important. If the return of Jesus was not true, then the whole Christian faith unravels. The whole Christian faith is pointless and incomplete. Think about this for a moment. Denying the return of Jesus Christ is also denying the perfect birth, death, and resurrection. Why would there be an actual physical death that happened with eyewitnesses? Why would there be an actual physical resurrection 
After three days, the stone was rolled away where Jesus' body had been placed. There was a guard looking after the, the tomb, but the physical body of Jesus was no longer there. Jesus had said that he would destroy the temple and the temple would be rebuilt in three days. You see that in John 2, verse 19. So why would there be a physical ascension? Jesus prophesied about his ascension to be with God the Father, and there were eyewitnesses to this fact and eyewitnesses to his ascension. Think about this for a moment. Jesus, Son of God, coming down from heaven as baby first, living among the people, physical death, physical resurrection, physical ascension, but he never returns when he said he would in Scripture. That would break the whole Christian faith. So the return of Jesus Christ is just as important, if not more important, as it is the completion of the saving work of Christ. John Piper says, the center of Christianity is the coming of the Son of God into the world as a real man to destroy the works of the devil and create a new people for his own glory. The very heart of our faith is that he did this by obeying the law of God dying for the sins of his people, rising victorious over death, ascending to the God's right hand with all his enemies under his feet. The second coming of Christ is the completion of his saving work. If you take it away, the whole fabric of his saving work unravels. Jesus, through his ascension, is sitting at the right hand of the Father until the time to restore all things come until the time to return, as he said he would in his word. Hebrews 9, 27, uh, 27, verse 27 to 28 says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, after that comes just judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The saving work of Christ comes at the first coming. He bore our sins on the cross. Our sins nailed and pinned him on the cross so that he might make us right with God the Father. The return of Jesus will not be to deal with sin because he's already done it. It will be to complete his saving work, to save us from final judgment and the wrath of God. Christ bought the first time what he gives the second time, which is safety in the coming judgment. Christ bought at the cross the first time what he gives the second time, which is safety in the coming judgment. When Jesus returns, we will enter eternal life with him. We will have our resurrected bodies, which is the final goal and hope of our salvation. If you remove the return of Jesus Christ, then we have nothing. We have no salvation. The whole fabric of our saving work unravels. So who is the return for? Who is the second coming for? The return of Jesus Christ is for those who are waiting for him. Titus 2 and Hebrews 9 says that. Those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Titus 2 verse 13 says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. The return of Jesus is for those who are eagerly waiting for him. Hebrews 9 verse 28 says the same thing. So Christ, having been offered once at the first coming to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, his return, not to deal with sins, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The return is for those who are eagerly waiting for the return, for the return of Jesus Christ. Those who are hoping for this, his return, those who are um, praying for his return, those whose minds are set on his return, which is true because he said it will happen. The return is for those that belong to Jesus Christ, who are his people, and that only happens if you know the grace of God that has appeared and that brings salvation. If you've given your life to Jesus, the return is for those who believe in the perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension, and return of Jesus Christ, affirming him as Lord and Savior. The return of Jesus is not for those who claim to believe in Christ only because they are running away from the wrath of God. That is not saving faith. 
and you are waiting for the chance not to face eternal fire and damnation. It is not for those who claim to believe in Christ only because he's a provider, because he has given many things, house, job, many earthly things. That is not saving faith. Mm -hmm. And you're waiting for him to give you more of his gifts, not more of him. The return of Jesus Christ is not for those who claim to believe in Christ only because he heals or protects. The return of Jesus is not for those who don't believe that Christ is enough. Those who supplement their faith with ancestral worship or other religions. That is not saving faith. No, in Christ alone, our hope is found. You will be disappointed when Jesus returns if you have not put your faith and trust in him as king, as lord and savior first. Does he save us from the wrath of God? Yes. Does he provide? Yes. Does he heal? Yes. But those things are not things of first importance and not saving faith. But faith in the things of their thing their faith in the things of God and not God. The return of Jesus should be compelling that we were dead we were lost and we were in sin and rebellion with God. We deserve to face the consequences of our sin and rebellion, but God made a way through the perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and return of Jesus Christ. We don't know when his return will happen. We know that it will be soon. It will be like a thief in the night. You won't have time to prepare for it. If you're sitting here this morning or listening on YouTube or the audio podcast, consider the gospel. Consider this truth. The return of Jesus Christ will happen. This day is coming. Implications of the return of Jesus Christ. The return of Jesus Christ changes everything. If you believe that it is true, it should change how you live. It should give you hope. We look back to the first coming of Jesus his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection and ascension, and we look forward to his return. We live in between these two points, after this first coming and before his return. While we live in between these two points, we wait for the blessed hope. The blessed hope is Jesus coming, Jesus Christ returning. But waiting for his return is not passive. It's not like waiting at a window with the curtain slightly open and peeping out, waiting for someone. It's not passive. There is this meme, or or meme if you would call it in in a local language, there's this meme with a skeleton on a bench that is normally captioned like, waiting for my brother to return, or or waiting for someone to call me. (laughs) The The waiting for his return is active. We are continually purifying ourselves for Jesus so that we are becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. We are continually purifying ourselves for Jesus so that we are becoming more and more like Jesus. Remember the aim of the grace of God is so that we would be changed, we would live godly lives, deny godlessness, while we wait for the blessed hope. Grace of God has the effect of, of, of us being redeemed and doing good works. So we're not passive as we wait for his return. The good works include the sharing of the gospel where God has placed you. So that others experience the grace of God through the Holy Spirit and they too have a blessed hope. Then they live in the effect of the grace of God and share the gospel with others and the cycle continues. We can only do this by the help and power of the Holy Spirit and by being filled by the word of God. Consume the word of God and the Holy Spirit working in us so that we live godly lives, denying godlessness and doing good works. You can only do good works or deny godlessness if you are heeding or listening to the Holy Spirit and spending time in God's word. We need to let the Bible break the unbelief in our hearts. Whatever situation we're going through, we need the gospel to break the unbelief and doubt that God is not at work or that God is not there. We need the gospel to break that unbelief. We trust, that Jesus, we, we trust Jesus to do what is good and just to make all things right. So in the midst of challenge or trial, we remember that even though we are, what we're facing is real, it is real, but it is temporary. 
and we look back to find hope, and we look forward to finding him in the ultimate return of Jesus Christ. That should bring us hope. If we truly believe that, then we are eager to share it. So three observations as we close from the blessed hope. It's hope that brings freedom. Because of the work of Jesus Christ, we are free from the slavery of sin. We belong to God. We are blessed and free from facing the wrath of God when he returns as judge and king. Romans 8 verse 1 says, There is no longer condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God makes a way through Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection to make us right with him, to restore the broken relationship that exists because of sin. All we have to do is repent and believe. So there's freedom in the blessed hope. But it's also a literal hope. Second observation. It is a literal hope. The birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension were all actual literal events that that took place. Jesus was a man here on earth. He died and rose again physically. Therefore, we know that he will return physically. And he will return to judge the world. And take up those who are his with him to a new heaven and earth. With redeemed and restored bodies. He will shield those who are his from the wrath of God. Lastly, it is a glorious hope. While we wait for the return of Jesus Christ, we know that he will return in glory. Revelation 6 verse 13 to 16 says, One like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face like the sun shining in all full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive. It will be glorious when Jesus Christ returns in all his glory. Like the words of a song that I love. Um, There is a day. It says, there is a day that all creation is waiting for. A day of freedom and liberation from the earth. And on that day, the Lord will come to meet his bride. We are his bride, church. And when we see him, in an instant we'll be changed. We'll be in our redeemed bodies. We will be changed when we meet him. The trumpet will sound and the dead will then be raised by his power never to perish again. Once only flesh, now clothed with immortality. Death has now been swallowed up in victory. We will meet him in the air and then we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Then all hurt, all pain will cease and we will be with him forever. And in his glory, we will live. What a glorious day. When we'll meet him in the air as he comes, we will see him as he is. Let me tell you something else about that day. Every single knee will bow. Every knee will bow. This is a quote from Isaiah 45, and Paul uses it in Philippians 2 as well. At the return of Jesus Christ, every knee will bow. The scary thing is if you don't know him or don't have saving faith, if you have not put your faith in, if you have not put your faith in God and that perfect death, resurrection, ascension, and return, then you will bow the knee with great fear and great trembling. Your greatest fear is small to the fear you will experience at this return. If you don't know him as Lord. Those that know him will bow the knee with great joy. Remember, all the knees will bow. Those that know him will bow with great joy, with adoration, gladly bowing to the King of kings and Lord of lords, who has come back as he promised to complete the work of salvation, to keep us from the wrath of God. The perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and return of Jesus Christ changes everything. I implore you, if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, consider him, investigate him, Speak to us, and you can send us an email at community at Fellowship City. We can speak to us after the service. But don't harden your heart if he's knocking at the door of your heart through the Holy Spirit. If you know Jesus as Lord and Savior, then there is great hope in whatever situation you find yourselves in. There is great news 
There is hope in the pain, in the confusion, in the hurt, in the despair, in the doubt of life. Cry out to him. Call out to him in prayer. Let's pray. We will take a moment and you may want to speak to God. You may want to tell him where you are. After a moment, I'll pray for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you that through the act of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross for us, we have life and life abundantly. We thank you that the perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and return of Jesus Christ are the cornerstone of our faith and are important. We pray that you'd help us to continually speak the gospel to the unbelief in our lives when we question any of those things, when we question whether our God is there, when we question when we question whatever season we find ourselves in. May we be filled with hope as we think about our blessed hope. Our hope is in the first coming of Jesus Christ, that he came that he lived among us, his people, that he died, that he was resurrected, that he ascended and he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father and he's, he's mediating and interceding for us. And our hope is also that he is to return. And when he returns, we will be with him. What a glorious day that would be. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to speak to us through your Holy Spirit. Tell us those things that you'd want us to know, to say, and to do. Would you encourage us where we need encouragement? Would you rebuke us where we need rebuking? Would you turn us to yourself? Draw us to yourself. Let it be true of us and our hearts that we believe that in Christ alone our hope is found. In Christ alone our hope is found. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.